Well, thank you for that discussion. We're going to move on now to talk about uh, the management of patients with relapsed uh, or refractory myeloma and, and provide some key updates on recent data and practice patterns. Um, so Tom, let me start with you. How, what sort of principles do you use when you're selecting your, your relapse therapy or subsequent therapy after induction? Yeah, there's probably three things that I consider. Uh, first is what are their current and residual toxicities or comorbidities that I have to worry about when choosing the regimen? The second is, is what they have been uh, on in the past and what they may be either refractory to or what I think they may be most sensitive to. And then the third, which is you know, part of the patient's uh, part of this is convenience, is which one can they come to the center relatively easily to get a subcutaneous injection or to get a IV medication. And so those, with those three things, I think that's pretty much um, how I choose it. Probably if there's a fourth thing, it's, you know, how they present. If they present really aggressive, then I know I have to choose a regimen that's actually going to provide a good, substantial improvement in their really aggressive disease. And, and just in terms of um, your, your thinking around the course that you're going to pursue with that patient, is, is a second transplant in your radar or are you committing to a long-term use of a uh, relapse regimen? So I'm not a big fan of second transplants um, right out of the gate in, in first or even second relapse. I think some of the salvage regimens that we currently have provide quite a, a significant progression-free survival advantage um, without having to use a transplant. So for me, it's a, it's a triplet-based regimen um, and not a transplant at that time. So Peter, uh, let's assume our patient has had what we just all described as standard of care, which is VRD transplant and lenalidomide maintenance. Now they're progressing on lenalidomide. What, what are you doing for those patients? What's your choice of regimen? assuming that they're eligible to come into the hospital and everything else. Sure. So the, the two regimens that I think are the most um, attractive in the situation would be daratumumab, palmalidomide, dexamethasone, and daratumumab, carfilzomib, dexamethasone. Uh, just given the, the biologic rationale of incorporating an imid with a monoclonal antibody, I think a lot of us gravitate towards the darapalm dex triplet over the daracarfilzomib dex triplet. But I think it would be very interesting to do a randomized trial in this exact patient population comparing the two. I think that they would both perform very well. Uh, so you're sticking with an image even although they've just progressed on lenalidomide? Yeah, I mean, I think we've got good data that palmalidomide has activity in lenalidomide refractory patients, even when they've become refractory in their most recent line of therapy. And what data would that be? Uh, so that would be palm dex uh, doublet um, uh, in patients with lenalidomide refractory disease. Um, I mean, I think whether you know the lenalidomide refractoriness is on the most recent uh, therapy or previous, um, there is a benefit to palm dex in that situation. I, I just want to you know highlight Pete's trial for Alliance. I think that's going to be very interesting when those results come out. So he's looking specifically at patients progressing on lenalidomide maintenance and then randomizing them to pomalidomide dex versus pomalidomide exazomib dex. And I think those results will be very interesting as to you know, whether they really can show a triplet is a, the better move at that point. And these are patients who are largely have, if, if you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, sort of indolent relapses, more or less sort of biochemical type. Yeah, this is biochemical progression and uh, with a crossover. And, and okay, Nupur, what, what are you up to in yeah, so I do put a lot of patients on Pete's trials, <laughs> the ones with the biochemical progression. But I do think most of us would turn to a palm-based regimen because the data does suggest that uh, it does work in Len refractory patients. What the partner to the palm is largely dictated by the nature of the relapse. So if you have somebody with high-risk features, aggressive relapse, that's where I would reach out to the carfilzomib palm dex combination. And if not, then you can choose between CAR, uh, palm deradex, which is a very effective treatment, and more of those indolent relapses is where I would use uh, Pete's uh, Alliance trial. Tom? Yeah, the, I do think there's a lot of regimens that can be used with palm dex as a backbone, and, and we've shown many studies. So there's also elituzumab with palm dex, and sometimes we choose that in patients that may, may be more frail. Um, it, the infusion reaction rate is only 10%, which is great. It's a very well-tolerated drug. 
And the other thing I'll mention is isotuximab. So the other CD38 that now is approved for use is isotuximab together with POM and DEX. And if you look at the, just the subset of patients that are LEN refractory um, in a subgroup analysis, they do they still do well on the ESA POM DEX versus POM DEX. The triplet does better than the doublet. So just, just for the audience to keep up with us here, uh, isotuximab is another uh, monoclonal antibody targeting uh, CD38. So it's um, sort of second in class uh, drug that resembles daratumumab. Uh, Tom, you've used both of them quite a lot. Do you have any um, suggestion that one might be better than the other or there's any advantages to one over the other? They're both uh, seem to be quite active. Yeah, so they've both been um, used in the refractory setting as single agents together with lenalidomide, together with pomalidomide, ortezomib, and carfilzomib. And honestly, in the if you compare all the studies, they're very similar in terms of overall response rates and PFS. So I do think um, they work very similarly and probably have the same overall um, activity. And so which one would you choose, and, and if so, why, if you had all things being equal in, in your patient? So currently, just to prove also is subcutaneous uh, dosing of daratumumab. The convenience of subcutaneous dosing, the five-minute dose, I think is going to uh, be a win-win for infusion centers like ours that are very busy, and also for patients that don't want to sit in the chair for two or three hours to get their IV infusion. So for me, it's a subcutaneous injection is going to is going to win out. Have you been able? To, well, uh, Peter, your center did a lot of work with subcutaneous daratumumab. Are you using that routinely now? Uh, so we're in the process of getting it on our outpatient formulary. So we don't have uh, access to it yet, uh, but we're hopeful as long as the, uh, the economics uh, make sense that we'll get this on our formulary and we'll start converting to, uh, patients to subcutaneous daratumumab in every situation we can.